Um, so welcome back, everyone. Let's get started. Um, so first an announcement, um, if you are interested in getting involved in so computing research, um, but aren't sure where to start. Um, so this is something we as, you know, so faculty in the School of Computing have been, you know, so hearing about. And there's some aspects of so research that if, you know, it, it, so if I'm, you know, so I'm gonna bring someone into my research group, it takes some, you know, it, so it takes, you know, so some amount of time on my part to get someone up to speed. Um, and so I can't take on everyone who asks me about it. Um, but, the, and so, but, but sometimes I have an opportunity and I don't have, you know, so someone who's a good fit. And so there's part of it, which is like a matchmaking issue. And so one thing school, school computing is trying this year is to have, so is, is to have a research day where a number of so undergraduates and graduate students are presenting so posters and so these are kind of there aren't necessarily going to be a lot of so faculty there but they're going to be kind of um say so some graduate students and they may be an in into like a research lab if you find something interesting going on in <laughs> in um so kind of on this day you can kind of build a relationship with the graduate student, which will build your relationship into the group, or it's kind of an easy way just to see what's going on. So if you're interested in this, um, this is not during our class, it's on a Wednesday. Uh, so um, if you don't have a conflict, it might be an interesting thing to do. Um, so, okay, great. So uh, cs.utah.edu slash, so, so like research dash day. Okay, um, any questions about it? I can. Uh, so, so I think I told you pretty much all I know about it. I think one or two of students associated with me will have some posters there as well. Uh, so, okay. So, so today we're going to switch and start talking about statistics. So this is a uh, probability and statistics for engineers. So far we've been talking about probability, which is kind of the core tool used to work with statistics. And I think today you'll start to see why. Um, so, okay, so we're going to cover a fair amount today. Um, one way of seeing this is, is looking at the schedule. We've kind of, we're starting statistics. We'll talk about confidence intervals and like hypothesis tests and stuff for the rest of the semester. Um, if you notice this, this lecture covers chapters 15 through 17. So I'm gonna cover kind of a lot of key ideas today. We've also kind of had a fairly big jump from, so from chapter 10. Um, so we're gonna be covering a lot of stuff today to kind of get you up to speed on statistics. Think about conceptually, what is it? And how does it involve, so using probability, you know, to make inferences about, so data. We'll start to see that. Um, and so kind of a main, you know, so that kind of conceptual thing will be like one main takeaway. The other one will be talking about, so the central limit theorem, which is a super important, you know, so concept was that, that we'll see today as well. So, okay. Um, a couple of other announcements, um, homework five is out. It's posted, we talked about a little bit on Thursday. I've got copies of it up front here. Uh, the printer was going a little weird and put a black stripe on it, but it should hopefully be, so still be okay. Um, so if you trouble printing stuff out, I'd bring copies to class, okay. Um, so, okay, so any other, um, any questions about, so probability before we kind of, we kind of, I wrapped up stuff a little bit in a rush in the last lecture, but I, I think we covered kind of the most important stuff. Um, so, okay, great. So let's get into it. Um, yeah, and kind of partially because we're covering a lot of stuff today, I have so slides, not huge fan of slides usually, but I have slides in this case. So we're gonna use them. We'll go back to kind of me writing on the iPad starting the next lecture. So, okay, um, 
So, okay, so, um, okay, one really important concept, and I don't just want to brush over this, um, this idea of, uh, so independent and, and so identically distributed random variables, IID, all right, so this is an abbreviation you will see a lot if you look in papers in like machine learning and like data mining and in statistics. Sometimes it's not, it's just written IID and it's assumed it encapsulates everything in this kind of box and some other stuff. <laughs> so I'm gonna say about it. We'll see several consequences of this today. Uh, sometimes it's not even written, it's just kind of assumed about the data, okay? So this, what this is kind of, what this is referring to, IID, means that you're getting a bunch of random variables, okay? So random variables X1, X2, up to Xn, okay? You're getting a bunch of these random variables, and they're all, um, they're all from the same so distribution. Okay, you don't necessarily know what that distribution is, but they're all from the same distribution and they're all going to, going to be independent. They're independent draws from the same so distribution. All right, so this is going to represent um, observations of, um, of so data. Okay, we're gonna make a bunch of observations about the world. We aren't there yet, okay? But we're going to be talking about observations about the world. Um, and we're, this is kind of the core underlying assumption that kind of makes the math work, like it makes the math work much easy. So you can do computation, you can kind of, um, kind of so compute bounds and probabilities much easier. Um, and, it, if you don't assume all your observations of the world are from the same sort of generating so distribution and that they're independent from each other, things become significantly more complicated. Okay, so for the rest of the semester and possibly for the rest of uh, your time in school, <laughs> uh, you know, so in the university, you, you may be considering that all of your random variables are going to be IID. It's just that common of an assumption. If you get to advanced classes in statistics and machine learning, you start to like think about what happens if this assumption is not true. But for like the next three classes in the sequence, you're basically gonna be making this assumption about all, all your observations. Um, so for the most part, okay? so. So we're gonna assume we have a bunch of random variables and they're all IID, they come from the same distribution. Okay, so if I'm considering um, like, uh, right, so we had this kind of example uh, that we talked about in like the homework where like the projector had like an exponential distribution of, uh, so failing, so during the class. And I could say, okay, Every class period, I don't know what happens outside class, but I kind of observe it during class. So every class period is kind of like an independent observation of the phenomena that is the projector, right? They're all independent of each other. Um, what happened in one class doesn't really affect what happened in the other class, right? They're all observing the same projector. So I can observe stuff over the semester and then try to draw some conclusion about that, okay? So, so the fact that they're all observing the same thing means I get more data of the same thing. I can draw a, a better conclusion about it. And so by the end of the lecture today, we'll see a little bit about why you can draw a better conclusion with more data, assuming you have this, this, you know, this IID assumption, okay? All right, if I go past this, what does, what does IID stand for? Okay, so someone in the back, great, yeah. Uh, great, independent, identically distributed, okay? It's kind of, for the rest of your, <laughs> for most of the rest of your life, it won't be written down for you. You should assume you remember what IID means, okay? So if you say IID, independent, identically distributed. Okay, that's uh, um, probably the first time I taught this class, I'm like, okay, this is kind of something simple. We need to say it, and then I brushed over it, and probably everyone forgot about it, but it's, 
it's it's hard to look this up. It, now, if you type IID into Google, like I ch I checked before class, it's like the sixth thing down, you can figure out what it means. When I was a, a graduate student or an undergraduate student, I saw this abbreviation and I didn't know what it meant. And I tried to put it into Google edit, like IID, what does that mean? It, it wasn't showing up. I could not figure out what it meant. Uh, okay, so it's, it's right here for you. Um, uh, so it's important. Okay, so one consequence of this, there'll be other consequences. One consequence is up here, is that if we wanna look at the joint probability distribution of a bunch of these random so variables, X1 through Xn, I can write it as the product. The independence means I can write it as the product and each of these probability distributions here are all the same. It says F of Xi, but really it could be F of X1, right? I could just as soon write this as the product from I equals one to N of F of X1 of, of so Xi, because they're all the same distribution, right? So this will really simplify so calculations. All right, okay. Okay, good. Um, uh, so the next important concept is that we're going to be um, thinking of a random sample from a distribution. And these will be IID random variables from this underlying so distribution. Um, and so we'll be calling these like these observations a random sample. N will be the size of the sample. N will be kind of how many samples do we have. And this will dictate how much accuracy we have in our so estimates, right? So this N will now be an important so parameter, okay? Um, so, right, so this is where you know, an experiment where N independent <laughs> RAM measurements are taken. And, okay, so here's the other thing. So far I've been talking about random variables, okay? Um, but when we actually have data, this is the first time I'm actually kind of talking about actual data in the whole semester. I've tried to be careful not to so far, is that when we have a realization of those random variables, Okay, these are now gonna be written in, so lowercase here, right? X lowercase x1 through, through lowercase xn. These are the actual observations. These are fixed values that we actually, so see, right? When you actually collect data and you have a list of values, there's the realizations, but we're still talking about these, these random variables up here. Okay, so we wanna, the random sample, we're talking about random variables which are before we have the observations. We wanna think about what if I made an observation before I actually look at the data, okay? There's a lot of work you do before you actually start to look at the data, okay? Kind of like this semester. We haven't looked at any of the actual data yet. We've been doing a lot of work <laughs> talking about probability to build up to this point. All right. Um, um, so, okay. So, once we have the data, we wanna talk about statistics on this data, but we actually start by thinking about these functions on random variables, on the sets of random variables. That's what we'll talk, that's what we'll call a statistic. Okay, a statistic will be a function on the random variables. We talked about things like um, kind of how we take, you have a, a joint random variables and we were thinking about often the non-independent ones, and we wanna say, what's the expectation when you take a function of this, uh, of this random variable? Okay, so some common examples of this are like if you take the, so the sample mean, right? So I take a bunch of random variables, x1 through xi, and then I compute the mean of, so the random variables, right? This, this guy right here is another, so, so random variable, okay? X bar, so sub N, right? I'm adding up the random variables that haven't been assigned yet. They each have their probability distributions, right? And I'm, I'm you know, I'm dividing by them. And so that, that function of the individual sampled, of sampled 
kind of um, random variables, the XIs is a new sort of random variable, which means it's gonna have a probability distribution, it's gonna have an expected value, it's gonna have all of these properties, okay? Um, and what we're gonna think of is how does, like one thing we'll look at is how does the kind of the expectation or the variance of Xn bar compare to that of a single observation? Can we say something more interesting about when we have a set of observations and we average them than if we take a single observation? So spoiler, the answer is gonna be yes, okay? Um, but, but sometimes the, the average isn't the right thing to do. Um, okay, another thing we might wanna do is to take a, so a sample variance, okay? So this is, again, we first create, um, this would be Xn, this is the random variable, which is, so the average, right? Um, or, or it could be X bar, it turns out, yeah, those are gonna be the same. Um, and I'm subtracting Xi from that and taking the sum of the squared things, right? This is how you would calculate, so the variance is the, the uh, variance of the um, the variance, remember, of of x um, i, remember, is the uh, expected value of x i minus x bar squared, right? And so I'm doing that, but I'm now taking the sum of these, and I'm basically taking an average, except I'm dividing by n minus one instead of by n. Okay, we'll see a little bit about why you divide by n minus one instead of n in, on so Thursday's lecture. All right, but, um, but I'm doing something kind of like an average of these um, variances from, from each of the individual so random variables. Okay, and this is called the sample variance, right? So this is a statistic and this has a probability distribution, right? All right, so other sort of, so statistics, we only very, very briefly, I think, talked about these during the semester, uh, kind of earlier in probability, but you can do things like, like the order statistics, where if you have a bunch of random variables, I can, my function can be more than just kind of this closed form calculation. I can instead say, I'm going to sort them, and we're going to pick um, the median of, of, uh, of the values in this sort of order, right? So if there's an odd number, that's it's one of the elements. And in this case, I say, if it's an even number, I'm gonna pick the middle two elements and then I'm gonna take the average of those two. And that's what I'm gonna call the median, okay? Um, in general, the ith order statistic is the ith element in the list, right, of n items. Um, or the, the quantile is the first point at um, the pth quantile at which P proportion of data is below, right? So the 50th percent quantile, yeah, so the 50th percent quantile is what? The, the quantile at when P equals 0 0.5. So Q of N at 0 0.5 is equivalent to what? So, so that would mean that it's the first point at which half the data is of, of the data is below, right? Let's say we have an odd number of points, n is odd. Was the quantile at value 0 0.5, right? So let's think of, when I think of the order statistics, I like to think of a cumulative density function, right? So I go from, these are the, real values here. This is the, um, let's say, f of x, the CDF. And then the, the, the CDF is a monotonically increasing curve. Okay. And so now I look at, this goes from zero to one, and this would be 0 0.5, right? This is an interesting point, 0 0.5 corresponds, it's the first data point where half the data is so below here, right? So this value would be Q of N of 0 0.5. I've drawn this for a CDF curve, which is kind of just like a curve, but 
I'm actually counting when I have actual kind of um, kind of random variables, if they had been realized, at, if they actually had values, there would be kind of a step function here where I'd actually, I see one value, I go up one over N, okay? But these are random variables, right? So they have each a probability distribution, but now I'm thinking I have N of these random variables and I wanna look at the median of these N random variables, right? It's some function I could compute. I can write a piece of, so, a, a function in, a, in, in code that is going to compute the output of this, right? I can take in the random variables. Once I realize them, I can sort them and I can compute the value such that the smallest value such that half of the, of the observations are less than that value. Okay, so that's a little bit more complicated than just taking the average, right? Um, and that, I mean, the, the average I can analyze, it's a, it's a linear function. This is something where I need to do sorting. Right? It's not hard to write code for that, but I can think about this sort of statistic on the data. Okay, who's had a chance to think about this question? What is, if I have an odd number of data points, what is the, the, um, the empirical quantile at um, P equals 0 0.5 equal to? Yeah. Yeah, this is the same as the median, right? The median is where, Basically, half the data is on either side, and if there's an odd number, then it's it's the single point in the middle. All right, that makes sense. Yep. Yeah, if it's even, okay, you're 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 off by like one data point from you know for one value from the the median. Um, sometimes you, def you can define the median in some places you'll define it as like the, as the empirical quantile at value. So 0 0.5, that's, that's a reasonable definition of, of the median, um, in, <laughs> uh, so in some context, yeah. Um, th these are kind of, as N gets big, these, the difference between them, you know, you know, so starts to go to zero. A lot of statisticians care only about what happens as n gets really big, right? As kind of a more of a data scientist, I said, well, my n never goes to infinity. n is always some, I only have n data points, right? That's usually not changing. So I like to know with, res with respect to actual n. Um, but, you know, if you talk to like a real statistician, they, they only care about as n goes to infinity, and then these are the same. Right. So, okay. Um, all right, and then in general, there are, uh, so like the quartiles are kind of these interesting points. We'll see um, the inter uh, where you look at P equals one quarter, one half, so three quarters, and we'll see an example of like a box plot soon where you kind of get a, a good capturing, simple capturing of a distribution by just kind of computing, so these values, all right? so. Here's another question. What is the empirical quantile when P is equal to one? What is that equal to? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the maximum you expect. That's, that's the distribution of the maximum of N draws. Uh, um, so from something. These extremal statistics, like what is the, kind of distribution of the maximum of a distribution is kind of a complicated, you know, so study and topic. Um, it's, um, it's not necessarily a great, very useful statistic because for instance, with the normal distribution, the maximum value you might see can go off to infinity, but it's very, very unlikely, right? So um, thinking about the, when you have like a hundred draws from normal distribution was the maximum, that's kind of a tricky thing to do, but not necessarily very useful for a kind of understanding very much about the distribution just by looking at this value. Um, but if you wanted to say, oh, well, <laughs> let's say, let's look at the average, uh, um, um, you know, so number of hairs on someone's head, right? So um, 
and so a distribution of, of, of people, how many hairs do they have in the head? Well, most people are probably somewhere in the middle, but someone might have a lot of hairs on their head, right? And, and so if it's a normal distribution, kind of understanding what that would be might be kind of a, an interesting question. Um, I don't know. Hopefully that was not too weird of an example. So, okay. Um, all right. Okay. Oh, yeah. Question. Uh, with that, you, uh, would yep. That's right. So then the, when P equals zero, that's, so that's the minimum. Let's see. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, so you have to, you know, have to be a little careful. If I define one, then maybe zero is not defined because you may, the proportion must be, if it's strictly below or below or less, right? It, it probably, depending on how we define this, and uh, it was not totally precise here, maybe either zero or one is not well-defined. Um, but yeah, so that's the right idea though. And these, and the differences again between them as n gets big is kind of like not that interesting, You're right? So, yeah, that's basically the minimum up to some arbitrary subtle choices in however the definitions. Right. Yep. So okay. So again, these these kind of values, these statistics are on random variables, um, but. It's uh, so it, it has a distribution, and in general, we want to kind of study that distribution, right? Um, so if you perform an experiment, we'll get a whole bunch of observations, right? X1 through Xn. Um, and if you plug these numbers into the formula or into your function, right? The function that sorts stuff and takes the, the, the middle value, right? Then that's going to give a realization of the statistic. But the statistic itself is going to be a, a random variable, which has a distribution of those values. Okay. Um, when you get a realization, you know, that's not necessarily kind of telling you what's actually going on. That just happens to be what you observed, right? What you observed may have been something unlikely. We want to say how, you know, how much confidence you have in what you observed. To talk about that, you kind of need to go and think of phrase it in terms of the random variables, right? Um, all right, so this sample mean, again, we'll use uh, uppercase for random variables and lowercase for the realizations. We'll try and make this, this distinction. Um, again, I'll try and be clear with the, with the X's, uh, typically an uppercase and a lowercase X look about the same, but one's smaller than the other. So I'll, I'll do my best to make sure that's as clear as it needs to be. Um, so, okay. Um, all right. Let's do, yeah, let's do some examples now in R. Okay. Let's look at some data. We're not going to look at too much. Um, okay. Let's see. Okay. So we are going to look at, and this is again uploaded to the, so to the website. Um, have people looked at like the, so like the, um, so like the R markdown files on the website that I've linked off there, that's, that's clear to people have seen those in case you see a few people nodding, but in case, where did my, yeah, let's just to sh show you where these are, let's look at, I can go R examples. Okay. And, and this is just a file. Okay. Well, that'll be a little compressed, but I, I type in R, it shows the output. Kind of you can you can create these kind of um, these these knitted uh, um, files of the R markdown that 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 shows you all the stuff. Okay, so let's let's go and actually see it in R where that's a bit more kind of interactive. Um, okay, let's I'm kind of going back and forth between these, but I'll try and make the font. Okay, so. Okay, so we're gonna look at, oh, not that far down. How did it go down there? Uh, hold on, I just lost my console. Okay. Um, okay, so we're gonna look at a, a 
kind of a classic example that's just built into the R distribution. So this is a kind of a day set of so Old Faithful, right? The guys are at like Yellowstone. We've heard of this. And so it it kind of, when you just type in this data set, it says, oh yeah, I know what this data set is. It's going to have, and it, it, it kind of starts printing off the data set. It'll stop after about, so 10 rows, but you can click through their 272 rows. Um, you can click through and see the other ones if you want to. Um, but like, if you look at what's going on here, it will, it will tell you what row number you're on that's in the left. And then it has two kind of, um, so this is in like a data frame. It has labels on two columns. Okay, so each data observation is going to be kind of a pair of values. This is the second observation. It's going to be measured in some, so I think these are both measured in like minutes. And this will, um, so say the length of in minutes of, of the eruption, this geyser, how long it was spewing water in the air, and then the length until in minutes until the next eruption. Okay, these are these really nice discrete events. If you've ever been there, it's very clear when it starts erupting. It's pretty clear when it stops erupting, and then there's nothing for about an hour. Okay, the 54 minutes, a little under an hour. 79 is a little more than an hour. All right, so this is a data set. This, these are a bunch of realizations of some sort of distribution. We don't know what the distribution are, is, and we're gonna kind of assume that these are independent um, kind of realizations of this. We have 272. N is the number of observations we have. Okay, if you wanna know more about, um, so faithful, yeah, if we, if I click here, it'll actually, should run below here. Okay. Um, if you want to know more about Faithful, about this data set, you can put again a question mark in front. This is kind of like how you get the help. And it tells you, yeah, the, you know, all the details, right? It's a data frame, 272 observations, two variables, eruptions, waiting, right? So, in the, and the source of this. Okay. And you can print out and see these individual, um, right? If you just print out the, um, uh, just eruptions, right? Um, or let's say just waiting time. It now prints it out as a as a list instead, right? It's just a single. I'm just I can index into a single column, and now instead of trying to print it as a column, it says that's really hard to read when it's just a list of things. So I'm going to write it out as a row, right? They made this this decision. And in this case, it can fit 30 roughly or 29 things in, in each of the columns, starting, starting from one here, right? And it just prints them all out, okay? So pretty easy to kind of access this once it's in here, this data frame. Um, okay, um, okay, and, and then let's say I want to know, okay, tell me about this, this data set. And it says, oh, okay, let's get a summary of it. You just type summary, and it automatically outputs all these values for you for both eruptions and so waiting, right? Is this large enough to see these numbers now? Right, so I, so, so I, I want to know like the mean, the median, the third quantiles, the, the min and the max values. It, it kind of says, these are typical things people want to know about, about distribution. We're gonna compute these for you. This is what a, a reasonable summary of, of the distribution is. Right, and says, okay, the mean eruption time is three point so four eight eight so minutes, and the mean waiting time is so about like seventy one minutes. Okay, okay, um, pretty pretty simple. And there are a whole bunch of other stuff. You can, if you just want the mean, um, right, it'll just print out the mean or the median, um, you know, of just eruptions. Or I can compute the variance or the standard deviation, which is the this the sample variance, right? Or the sample so standard deviation, which is the square root of that, right? Again, R just it's it's like R was built for looking at this sort of data. It makes this sort of calculations we've been talking about as simple as possible. Okay, 
So you can do all this in Python if you want. And it's, you know, it's, it's not hard to do, but it's just kind of, it's like supernatural in, in, uh, in R. Okay. We have now joint, we have, uh, like two, um, kind of columns here. So now we can compute the, the covariance and the correlation as well. Um, okay. The covariance says, okay, they're positively correlate, um, uh, covariating with each other. That means as if the, if the wait time, this number says, well, if the, if the eruption time is longer, well, then actually the, um, the waiting time is also long. Okay. But again, I don't know how to quantify this number, 13.9. Is that big? I don't know if that's big. The, so the correlation, now that gives me a value of 0 0.9. That's, that's pretty big, right? The maximum it could be is, yeah, the maximum it could be is one, and I'm at 90% of, of one from zero. It could go to negative one, be negative correlated, okay? But these seem to be very correlated, very correlated with each other. Okay, so it's saying there might be something interesting about this sort of this, you know, so sort of distribution. Okay, so let's keep looking at these things and see if we can figure out. Um, a great way would be to kind of look at some visualizations of the distribution. Okay, here is a histogram. Right, maybe let's put it in in this box over on the side maybe it's a little better okay so i can look at the frequency of the of faithful of the, of the eruptions and this is in minutes it automatically kind of shows okay i'm going to put you know like this many bins um you kind of see okay there's something going on there's not too many eruptions that lasts about two and a half minutes. There are more that happen around two minutes and some around, so four minutes, right? There start to be something interesting going on here. That's not just a single distribution. Let's see. Um, okay, so let's maybe look at the empirical CDF. I can plot this as well. Let's see. All right, so now I've plotted that I've taken the data. I, I want the CDF, they call it the ECDF, that's empirical CDF because they're actual realizations. And I compute the CDF and then I compute the plot and some kind of, um, okay. And I see, yeah, I see that similar again. There's a bunch of mass that's going up here. About 40% are around two minutes and then about, 60%, the rest of them are between three and a half and so five minutes. Okay. So that's not, but there are very few around exactly like three minutes or around between two and a half and three minutes. Okay. So something interesting is happening here. Okay. Um, okay. Let's try a scatter plot. Let me pull it over on the right here. Let's see what happens. Oh, okay. This shows me some interesting stuff. What is, is, is going on here? Okay, so what do you think? Now that you've seen all these visualizations, what's going on with this data? What is this data, you know, so telling us? What conclusions could you maybe draw from this? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, so the... Right, okay, good. So we could see that array from like the histogram and then better with the empirical, so CDF. I like, I'm a big fan, if you ask me, I'm a big fan of the empirical CDFs instead of histograms. Histograms have this issue, it chooses these width of the bins and you get different views of it depending on the bin width or if you shift them. The empirical CDF shows you everything in the data, right? So you can kind of see that from the empirical CDF that there's a bunch of eruption lengths around two minutes and around four minutes, but not a lot around, so three minutes, right? Um, but now I've got on the y-axis, I also have the waiting time until the next eruption, 
Okay, so now I'm seeing, I'm viewing both of those distributions at the same time in the scatter plot here. I don't get them nicely kind of pre-added up like I got in the CDF, but there aren't too many that you can kind of visually see maybe what's going on here. Anyone else draw any other conclusions from this? What else can you maybe observe from this? Yeah. Great. Yeah, okay, great. There are two types of eruptions, the shorter and the longer, but now I can maybe connect that with, so the waiting time. Can, yeah. Yeah, great. So if the eruption, the conclusion you kind of want to draw from this is if the eruption is shorter, then the waiting time is probably also going to be shorter. Right, and if the eruption is longer, this probably the waiting time is so then also going to be longer, right? Does everyone kind of see why that, right? What what kind of one parameter, one value before told us that this was that that part of it was kind of true, right? That if the the eruption was shorter, that the waiting time would be shorter. Where did we see that earlier? Yeah. We saw when we looked at the correlation. Yeah, the correlation was 0.9. And that told us there was there was a kind of a uh, if if the eruption was shorter, the waiting time would also be shorter. If the eruption was longer, the waiting time would be longer. We already kind of saw that. In this single plot, we see these two kind of things going on. One, that correlation with shorter eruptions means shorter waiting time and longer eruptions and like longer waiting time, right? But we also see that there are really these two different types of eruptions. Right, the shorter ones and the longer ones. All right, so this is kind of a cool, cool data set. This is gone. If you ever go to like Old Faithful, they'll explain this to you. There's like a, a big cavity underwards that's filling up with water, and either it kind of explodes kind of early, and then it takes less time to refill, or it kind of um, it waits a little bit, or it has a bigger explosion and kind of gets all the water out, and then it takes longer to refill. There's some sort of actual geology that, that explains that the data actually works like this. Um, so, okay. So, and this, you can see really well from, you know, so plotting this data. All right. So, this is like, you know, uh, just a place where I want to pause and say, I'm someone who always kind of really liked the math side of computer science and like, and like data science. I like modeling stuff, you know, thinking about equations, thinking how to model stuff with formulas, that kind of always appealed to me. But this, this is really good. <laughs> this, this one visualization tells you a lot of what's going on here. And you don't, if you understand how to read this, you don't really need to calculate those numbers to tell you, oh yeah, it's correlated, or oh yeah, there are really two kind of types of eruptions here. You can see that really well from the plot, okay? I, I, I've kind of, I've, you know, really so come around on this, that it's important to try and draw pictures of your data, and it will help you. It's, you might miss something if you just calculate the numbers, or you might miss some insight. You think you see, oh, it's correlated. I should, that's the key story. Or, oh, I applied the histogram. There are two bumps. There are two types of things. That's the key story. But really, there are these two elements that are mixed together. And this, if you get the right drawing of the data, you can see, you, you can, you can see a lot of what's going on. Okay. And if your data is in R, it's like one line. It's super simple to do all these things, right? Might as well just try and plot it and you know, so see what's going on. This is a really powerful tool. And don't be ashamed to say, oh, I plotted it. And that's why I draw the conclusion, right? Um, the mathematics will be good to verify it and will give you numbers. But those numbers, some you can, it's really easy to make a mistake, right? When you, when I ask you to do kind of stuff on the homework, you'll do calculations. Sometimes you make a calculation mistake and you get something wrong, right? You probably, if not in this class, I'm sure you've all experienced that at some point, right? If you're doing data science or statistics, that unfortunately happens too. If you plot it, you're often gonna you know, catch that maybe I did something wrong, okay? So these plotting tools are really easy to do, 
And it's it's often a, a, a like a really good idea. Okay. All right. So um, these are worth just kind of you know just playing with here. Um, yes. Okay. Let me show one other type of plot that this is data from um, this Morley's experiment, Mickelson Morley's experiment. This is from when they first tried to calculate what is the speed of light, okay? And they ran these five, I think four different experiments here. And let's see if this will draw properly. Okay. Um, okay, let me get these to draw. Okay, so I'm gonna draw, this is a little bit more complicated thing. I preloaded. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, I've drawn, there are five experiments here, and I've drawn the box plots from these five different experiments. And these, what are these box plots showing? Okay, these are showing these, like, like the order statistics, okay? This is a, a, a plotting system thing built into, uh, into R, it's very easy to use. Uh, the, the black line in the middle, the thick one is the median, right? This is the median. The box shows you the interquartile range between the 25th quartile and the 75th, or the 0 0.25 quartile and the 0 0.75. That means 50% of the data is in here. And then these are the, um, or these, these are um, kind of the, the min and the max. Um, sometimes it'll say, ah, oh, they're, they're outliers and won't go into how it determines that. It says, instead of showing the min here, I'll say, look, there are a couple of like outlier points here um, instead of showing the min and the max, okay? And these are five different um, kind of, um, uh, of these, uh, these experiments. And this kind of shows you guesses of how they're trying to calculate where they thought the the speed of light was, yeah. If, if something is what? Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. So that means that the distribution might be kind of skewed, right? Like they're in, yeah, in, in experiment, so number five, the median and the 25th quartile are very close to each other. That tells you 25% of the data is right in here, right? There's a lot of data in this experiment, the observations that fell in this range. That says, okay, well, that, that kind of, that doesn't look like a normal distribution, right? So, but, uh, you know, the, these order statistics don't need it to be a normal distribution to be useful. They kind of say, okay, that's kind of the middle. It kind of has it kind of more variation as it goes up than it goes down. But you know the minimum and the, you know and the maximum aren't that different. And you know the maximums maybe twice as far from the median as the minimum. But that's it's not as skewed as the twenty fifth and seventy fifth kind of uh, quartile. It kind of tells you a little bit more than just like the mean or just the median. It kind of tells you something about the shape of the distribution, and that's what it's trying to so convey here. All right, does anyone know what the true speed of light is? It's, it's written up here. Let's see. Okay, so it's right here. Okay, it's, it's, this, it's this red line. Okay, and um, so how well did these experiments do, right? It's not always, the true speed was not always in the, inter so quartile range of all the experiments, right? So it kind of was in the right, so ballpark, um, but kind of these were, these are observations from a distribution that in the limit, if I'd collected enough data and done the experiment totally correctly, it should have had kind of, um, it, it, it should have really been around the true speed of light. But it was pretty close. It's kind of in the right so ballpark of these estimates. Yeah.
Oh, um, yeah, okay. So the, the true, um, I, I, I'm just kind of, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I think I, when I first made use of examples a long time ago and I didn't check exactly where they came from. Do you know the answer? Yeah. So it's it's kind of it's a little bit strange to write minus two hundred two hundred ninety nine thousand. So I admit that, right? But it's two hundred ninety nine thousand, say uh, seven seven hundred ninety two uh, point four five eight. Otherwise, th th these numbers would have had two nine nine in in front of each of them, and it's just a little easier to read. I think is the main reason. It's still a little bit strange to narrow in here, but that's how I chose to do it. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. I'd say miles per hour is probably not very, you know, so standard in scientific experiments. Yeah, and in why kilometers per second have uh, kind of like mirrors per second? I don't know. They're 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 off by kind of uh, was it factor of a thousand of each other, right? So it's just moving the decimal point. So, so it's so yeah. So so is that? Um, I don't know. I don't view that as as a as a very big difference. Uh, so, um, I don't know. It's easier than having, having to look at larger numbers, I think. <laughs> oh yeah. Cause I wrote in different units than you were expecting. Okay. I'm, I'm glad I, <laughs> And so from your memory, I did get the number correct here. Okay, we have an expert, great, awesome. Okay, but okay, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so yeah, the ch choice of units, as long as you list the units, it sh should be clear. You can, you know, um, especially converting between kilometers and meters is pretty, pretty easy to do in your head. Yeah, so, okay. Um, right, so doing these sort of kind of calculating of the kind of the statistics on actual data sets and then plotting them is like super easy in R. This is why the language was basically built. It was built by statisticians who wanted to make this easy as possible because a lot of people were doing these same sort of calculations. And it's kind of, it's, you know, as doing this in C is not nearly as 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 going to be as easy, or even you know Python probably not too bad, but it's just simpler, easier in R. Okay, this is what's this is what it's made for. Uh, so okay, great. Let's go back here. Um, all right. So a few more things I want to say. I want to get to the central limit theorem. Okay. Um, okay. Well, okay. While R allows you to calculate stuff and it allows you to draw these pictures really easily, we want to say something kind of quantitative about what the data actually so tells us, right? We want to be able to quantify that. And we're going to use kind of all the probability we learn in how to do that. And so that's what kind of the rest of the semester will be about. Um, okay, and again, this because we're building this statistic, we're gonna think about the statistic as a random variable now. Before we're gonna do this pre-processing work, thinking about it 
as a random variable and thinking about its probability distribution, um, the sampling distribution um, of, of T before, you know, before we look at the actual numbers, right? To say, were those numbers kind of, how much do we trust those numbers, you know, so effectively, right? Um, all right, so we can, can say some things like, okay, if we knew something, if we know something about the distribution of any one of the data points, right? Then we can say something about the, the joint random variable um, of, or the joint distribution of all of the observations. And from that, because it's kind of a product, use that to calculate something about the random variable that is the statistic. And we can say, well, what is the probability that if we make some observations, that the statistic we observe will fall in some range, right? So probability falls between values A and B, right? So these are um, the, the sort of things we can actually kind of, to talk about how good is a, or like how unexpected is an, a statistic or observation based on assumption of the data, we need probability and all of the probability theory we've talked about in order to do that, okay? Um, Okay, so if, if we want to kind of, let's, we'll start with some simpler examples. And frankly, for most of this class, the, the examples we use will be pretty of the simpler variety are much more complicated things that we will not, you know, get into this semester. Okay, but let's look at just the mean and the, and the variance, right? Um, what do we know? So let's say we have some, some samples, these random variables, and we know something about their mean and their variance each individually, what can we say about that of the, the sample mean, right? I took all those random variables and I took their average. What can I say about the mean and the variance of this new statistic, the, av the sample mean, right? This is again, this is the new random variable as a combination of all the samples. Okay, okay. Key thing, the expectation is the same as before. Okay, so, so this is a really kind of key point. This comes from the linearity of expectation. The expectation of X and R, this is equal to the expectation of one over N, sum I equals one to N xi, right? By linearity of expectation, I can factor out the one over n. I can factor out the sum. This is one over n, i equals one to n, of the expectation of each xi, right? This is, I know this guy, this expectation is exactly mu for all of them. So one over n, i equals one to n, of mu, um, and now everything in the sum is, is, uh, is the same value, right? So this is equal to one over n times n times mu, and now the n and the one over n cancel, and it's exactly mu, okay? So by linearity of expectation, I get that the expected value of the distribution is so preserved as I, as I take the sample mean. Okay. So this by itself didn't help me do anything very much, right? I said, well, if I just took one random variable and I looked at its value, its mean was mu. If I took an average of a bunch of things, it's the same mean. I may as well have just taken one of the random variables, right? I didn't need to take a whole bunch of them. Why did I have a big sample of them? How does that help me? What's gonna help instead is, the, is gonna be the variance. What's gonna happen is as you take n of these, if you look at the variance of the sample mean, it's gonna be the original variance, sigma squared, divided by n. Okay, so what does this mean? What's the implication of this? This conceptually big picture. What's happening as I take more, more data? Well, okay, you're, you're kind of trying to jump ahead of us a little bit here. I haven't said, um, 
I haven't, from the data on there, it says nothing about being close to a normal distribution. So there might be some truth about that, but we'll get to that. that but that's not what this is saying. That's saying something a little more important than that. Okay, so something much more important than close to the normal distribution. Yeah. Great. The variance is smaller and smaller and smaller. Great. The variance is going down at a rate of one over n. Okay. So is that good or not? Does that seem useful? Yeah, great. Okay, great. Well, let me draw a picture, right? So let's say the original distribution looks something like this, right? So this is the original distribution. This is f of x. And I can draw on here, this is mu of x, right? And the, and the variance, well, let's say this standard deviation, right, is going to look something like this, okay? Okay. So that's about the standard deviation. What is this? If I draw now the, um, the, the distribution f of x bar, right? That's gonna, it's gonna have the same mean, right, as before, but its variance is gonna be smaller. So I'm not gonna say exactly what it looks like, but it might be some, but its variance, it still has to integrate to one, right? It still integrates to one, but the variance is smaller. So the standard deviation here, this is sigma x bar, right? That's much smaller than before, right? The, the probability that, it's, that the value I observe is far from the mean is much smaller than it used to be. That's what having a smaller variance is saying. Okay, so if I get more observations, it's somehow from being kind of spread out like the green function, to be more concentrated like the purple function. As I get more observations and I take the average, I'm getting a more concentrated distribution. So when I see observations here from X bar, they're gonna kind of fall in here. These are X bar, you know, th this would be like an observation, a realization of X bar would more likely be in here, where if I look at some realizations from X, they're more likely to be kind of like all over the place. So this would be kind of like X1, or this would be X2. So if I just looked at those, they might be all over the place, but if I average them together, then they're gonna give me an estimate which is closer to the mean. Okay, so this is a really powerful property. As I get more observations, I'm going to get, um, so, you know, get like a better estimate. Um, well, there's a couple of things that I felt that when we were um, doing this in in the semester, we kind of went through the variance discussion. And I kind of sometimes lost track of time in the in the in the lecture, and I just want to kind of talk about um, a couple of things about you know, so variance, if I have a random variable, so I have a random variable X and I have a constant alpha, then the variance of alpha X is going to be alpha squared times the variance of, of X. Okay, so I factor out this as a, that right um yeah that factors out as alpha squared here um okay so if i have this coefficient um so i i, I want to show you why you get this this one over n coming out um okay also if i have variance of this was i, I meant to cover this on thursday but let's say i have variance of x plus y I have random variables x and y. So what does this equal? This, I forgot to mention this on Thursday. This is variance of x plus variance of y plus 
two times the covariance of X and Y. Okay, so this is a little bit so messier, right? Now I need to worry about, so the covariance. But what, do I, what happens if X and Y are going to be independent of each other? What do I know if X and Y are independent? Yeah, so if X, X and Y are independent, then the covariance of X and Y equals zero, and that means that this is equal to the variance of X plus the variance of Y, okay? Okay, so if we have IID random variables, one of those I's stood for independent, right? So that they're going to be um, independent of each other and there's the covariance of zero. So I don't have to worry about, you know, so the covariance, right? So now let's say I have variance of one over N times sum of from, um, from I equals one to N of XI. Okay, what can I do to, to factor this? To factor this, the first thing I'm first going to apply this rule here. Okay, so I'm going to factor out the one over n. So this is one over n squared times the variance of i equals one to n of each of the x i's. Okay, I have one over n now and factor it out instead. Okay, now I'm gonna use this rule, but over a, a larger sum over N of these things. And I can just, then I can just move, if they're independent, I can move the, the sum outside here. So one over N squared, um, sum over one to N of the variance of XI. Okay, so now if I know that let's say the variance of each of the XIs. So if, um, if XIs are IID and the variance of XI equals sigma squared, well then I can plug that in there in the last, I have one over N squared times N times sigma squared. And now I cancel the Ns partially. I get one over N times sigma squared. I, because it factored out as n squared, because it was the expectation of a squared quantity, right? I factor out this, this one over n. Okay, so this is kind of how you can see that the variance when you add together, um, when you take an average of random variables, the variance is going down by a factor n. Okay. Good. Yeah, so if you have a bunch of random variables you can do and they have different variants, but, they have, but they're independent of each other, you get kind of a similar phenomena, just the calculations are messy. We'll be assuming IID basically from here on out. Okay, so they're all independent and they're identical, so they all have the same variance. Makes our calculations easier, makes conceptually everything simpler. We're observing one, one magical projector in the sky and over and over again. Yeah, okay, yeah, we can take, we can look at like the, ex first you need to look at, remember the variance is the, ex the expected square deviation from the expected value. So you first would need to calculate the expected value of the variance of a bunch of things. And then you need to look at the expected square deviation of that, uh, of the variances from their expected value. We'll, we'll look at something like this um, maybe today, maybe on Thursday. Not, not ex exactly this, but we'll start getting in that direction. Yes, yeah, so these are, are good questions. That's a little bit more complicated. Okay, so if we go back, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, let me just note here that the, the standard 
change my pen size. Okay, now the standard um, deviation of X and bar is, is gonna be what? What is the standard, standard deviation of X and bar? Of the standard deviation of the mean, yeah? You're right, okay. Square root of the variance is gonna be sigma, right? Because sigma squared, square root of that is sigma, and divided by square root n. Okay, so the standard deviation is useful because that's the quantity that we can actually draw that has the right, you know, so units. So we have the variance is going down at a rate of one over n, which is maybe a little bit easier to understand. But the actual quantity we can actually think about and figure that control stuff, how well, how fast it's actually shrinking in the right units is actually one over square root n. So that means if I want to reduce something by a factor 10, I need like 100 observations. If I want to reduce it by a factor of 100, I need 10,000 observations. Okay, so the variance reduces faster, but it's not really a quantity we can actually, actually kind of compare to real objects. So you often get to see this rate of, of things getting better and better at a rate of square root n instead of, um, instead of n because that's what the standard deviation does and that's in the right units, okay? If, yeah. Uh, we'll talk about standard error and it will be related to this, but it has more context we haven't fully developed yet. Okay. Yeah, so, okay. Um, yeah, okay, great. The third point, about this, about the uh, about this sampling distribution of the mean, is that yes, it will approximately look like a Gaussian or a normal distribution. Okay, so this picture I drew over here, uh, that that purple curve I drew kind of wiggly. Um, well, it's hard to draw this that doesn't kind of look like a normal distribution. It kind of is going to be centered around the mean and it's gonna have one mode. Um, and it's really gonna look like, I drew it squiggly cause I didn't want to, you know, so give the game away, but it's going to look like a normal distribution with mean equals mu and the variance equals to the, this kind of the, the variance we calculated. Okay, but the more observations we get, kind of the more and the more the shape of it will look like a normal distribution. So this normal distribution kind of, um, Kind of, that's one of the reasons that it is so kind of prevalent and so like why I said it was such an important sort of distribution to understand, okay? Um, we don't know much else, right? There are certain times we can say much more about this. We can say, we wanna actually say, okay, I, I, um, I made an observation from a bunch of data and I think it's, probably close to the true observation. And I want to quantify that statement. Sometimes you can say something just using the mean and the, and the variance. There's something called like Chebyshev's inequality, which I think we probably won't talk about on this class. So you can say something, um, but if you know more about the distribution, you can say something more precise about how close it is. I kind of only said, okay, the mean is preserved, the variance goes down at a rate of one over N and it kind of looks like a normal distribution. And that kind of looks like is tricky to specify what that means. I mean, in the limit, it will look like it, but what does in the limit mean? It's kind of weird. We can say some things more precisely if we make some assumptions on what the original distribution is. Okay, one particular thing about it is if the original data is actually from a normal distribution or a Gaussian distribution, um, then the exact distribution of the mean will also be normal, but, and it will have these parameters, right? The mean will be the same and the variance will decrease by, by one over n, and it will still be a normal distribution, okay? Um, you know, normal distribution is not an uncommon thing to consider, but this is kind of one specific thing that we can say. Um, but in general, we may not know what the original distribution is. Okay. Um, 
Another important distribution is the chi-squared so distribution. Um, okay, and the chi-squared distribution is when we have a sum of squared normal random variables. So we have a bunch of these normal IID random variables. And then instead of taking kind of their average, I'm doing something a little bit strange here. I've got K of them here, and I'm taking the sum of their values squared. Okay, this is not, yeah, so this is a bit stranger. This is a little bit hard to kind of think about, but this actually comes up a lot in statistics and in so hypothesis testing. Um, it has one parameter. It always assumes that they're, they're standard normal to start with, and then has one parameter K, this degrees of freedom. And if you go and you go to the, the Wikipedia page, you know, Wikipedia is great for statistics and probability. It lists lots of interesting stories and links things in different uses. There's a kind of a really long page of why this is useful. This is another distribution or another kind of um, distribution of a statistic, the chi-squared kind of statistic I can take from these, these random samples. All right. Um, okay, this is also... One of, one of the uses of it is to think about the, um, the sampling distribution of, of, so the variance, okay? And one thing we can say, remember, the sample, the sample variance uh, S of N uh, squared, this was, um, this was one over N minus one, of sum over i equals one to n of, let's see, this was xi minus x bar squared, right? So this was what we call the sample variance, okay? And if I take the sample variance here, right? And I plug it in here and then I undo this n minus one factor and I scale it by the, by the true variance, I recover, um, the chi-squared so distribution. So to understand kind of the sample variance we talked about, right, we have to understand this chi-squared, you know, so distribution, okay? Um, kind of in, in, it's a little kind of abusive notation, but you can kind of say, well, the sample variance is actually a chi-squared distribution times this, so times this factor, okay? Um, Okay, so again, it's a random variable, but now it has this, you know, so chi squared sort of distribution um, instead of kind of a normal looking distribution, right? So this chi squared also is showing up a lot. Um, not probably quite as much as a normal distribution, but it still kind of, you know, shows up pretty frequently. This is if we again assume the data came from a normal distribution. Um, if we didn't make that assumption, what you can say is, 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 is not going to be as clear. Okay, where should we? Let me, okay, I will, I will, this will be the last slide I'll say. Well, we're basically through the slide deck and then I'll just start on the iPad uh, on, so Thursday. Okay, so the last thing I want to say is, we'll, we'll probably review this again, but if I have a PDF and I, this ends up being a useful tool to have. I want to take a random variable and scale it by quantity K, a constant. Well, we know what happens with the expectation, right? The expectation of K X is equal to K times the expectation of X. But what does, what's happening with the PDF, right? So the, the, the PDF, remember the PDF has to integrate to one. So it's kind of doing this contortion uh, so that it's, um, it's still integrating to one. Um, so I'm taking, so let's say I have this original distribution with the mean here, um, right? So this is the original distribution. Now I'm multiplying it by two, right? What happens is now it looks like the same, 
should be the same distribution, but more spread out. That's, that's kind of, so if this is the mu of the new distribution, this is the mean of the old one, this is the value zero here, right? So it, um, it spreads out in this way, but, the, but I scale down by a factor two, right? The, the, the top value before, you know, is now half the value, right? So if this was max and this was the max value divided by two. Right, so I have to divide by one over k to scale it down, but I also kind of take the value and I'm, um, you know, the observation here, and then I divide this by two to get the equivalent observation in the blue distribution. So I kind of do this, if I multiply the RAM variable by k, I divide through it in the realization and a scaling factor so it still is, is integrating to one. Okay, this is kind of an important tool that we will will show up. Here. Okay, we were we're we're almost done with the intro. We'll do the talk about specifically the central limit theorem here. I'll I'll kind of give this away a little bit. Um, uh, starting on Thursday, and we'll get into so estimation. Okay. Um, all right. Well, we'll we'll stop here. <laughs>